Sometimes it's difficult to talk about things. I, I had the idea to talk about some of the people that I've known here over the years that are no longer with us, and, and I got to thinking about that, and I'd leave so many out that it'd probably be better just to say that, that we miss them. And uh, I've thought the last four or five weeks here at the church have been unusual to say the least. Uh, so I made myself some notes. I'm at the age I can't find my coffee cup half the time. But, uh, <laughs> you know, 200 plus people at Easter service, that's the most people I've seen in the sanctuary up there in a number of years. Uh, probably the most outstanding thing that's happened around here was Ten baptisms and several people joining the church during during this month. And uh, some of you probably know this, and I think Pastor Rick has mentioned it. But we're we're hosting to a certain extent uh, these AmeriCorps kids. There's seven of them, and they're using our kitchen and the. Uh, they're here to do various jobs through the community. But one of the things that Pastor Rick found out that their, their per diem is $6 a day. And if you can imagine a bunch of uh, 17 to 19 year old, 20 year old kids trying to eat on $7 a day, you can't go to McDonald's and get a hamburger and fries. And that's just one meal, so uh, that's part of our outreach. You know, there's been some questions raised about that over the years. Of, what are we doing for outreach? Well, we're reaching out to these kids. Pastor Rick took them out and uh, helped them buy some groceries. And and I think that's the kind of thing we need to be doing because they're, they're very pleasant, friendly kids and... Uh, and I just think that, that that's a, a good thing that we're doing by giving them a, a place to fix their meals because there's no way they're going to make it on $6 a day. Um, on another subject, uh, the sanctuary is almost done. So I think we'll probably be up there by next Sunday. Um, there's some work to be done between now and then just cleaning up, but I think that's going to be good. And in summary, I just say this has been a really active, good spring for FCC. And uh, we're approaching the time we got to talk about next year's budget, and, and that'll be coming up shortly. But uh, all in all, I'd say things are looking up. Let's go to prayer. Our Father in heaven, we just thank you for this day you've made for us. Lord, we pray for travel mercies on all, all those that are traveling on this holiday weekend. We just uh, thank you, Lord, with how you've blessed us and blessed our church. And we just ask that you continue to do that. And be with those who are ill and unable to be here today or just not here for whatever reason. And uh, in short, just... We ask, Lord, that you'd continue to bless us. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to take your hymnal and let's stand and sing 571. My country tis of thee. Let's remain standing and sing the next one, 572.
Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good to see everyone in the house of the Lord, especially on a holiday weekend. Of all the places you could be today, you chose to be here in worship at First Christian Church, and we are so happy that you're here today. We are thankful for all of those that are joining us by way of uh, live stream today. We welcome you. We hope that you're having a, a very safe uh, holiday weekend. But we have come today to worship and to lift up the Lord. A uh, couple of announcements. Uh, David mentioned, and I will reiterate, that next Sunday we will be back up in the sanctuary. So, everything is looking uh, very, very pretty up there, and uh, they have just a little bit more work left to do, uh, but they're as anxious to get done as we are uh, anxious for them to get done, and so uh, they should be done probably the middle of the week. That means that we go to work. And so next Saturday at 9 o'clock, we're going to have a uh, work day. Uh, the cleanup is a little bit more than we want to ask our custodian to do on his own. And so we're going to help him out. And if you can, come. And we're going to uh, dust and clean and uh, just do a little spring cleaning. We still have the dumpster out back, so things that maybe we need to... Uh, take this opportunity to uh, discard. We're going to do that. And uh, so uh, if you can be here next Saturday, 9 o'clock, if it should run long enough that we have to have lunch, we'll probably grab some pizza or something and feed everybody. Uh, so a little incentive to come and help. <laughs> but, uh, if you can be here, we would appreciate that very much. I'll also be sending out an email later on in the week as a reminder. Um, so uh, that's what's going on this week at First Christian Church. Uh, we are mindful today of uh, the fact that it is Memorial Day weekend, and I am uh, thinking about all of those families today, and I am sure that probably... Uh, it would be safe to say that most of our families are affected by this, that we had loved ones that have served in our uh, military uh, that did not come home from their uh, time uh, in the service. Today is a, a, a difficult day for uh, what is known as Gold Star Families. And uh, our thoughts are with them. Uh, I'm mindful today that we are not here except for the freedoms that we have been afforded and protected by those that were willing and are willing to serve uh, our nation. And so we want to pray especially for those families today that uh, mourn the loss of their loved ones and certainly those that uh, that has happened uh too recently, and uh, to remember them in our prayers today. Uh, also, uh, Carol Cole's uh, great-granddaughter, Emerson, uh, one of the twins, is going to be having a surgical procedure on Wednesday, and Carol asked that we would be in prayer for, for her, and we will certainly uh, do that. Uh, June Johnson asked us to place her grandson, Jay, uh, Shane McKee, on the prayer list. And so we want to be in prayer for him. And also, uh, this next week, uh, the Plains Singers, which is the high school choir, and some of the alumni are going to be traveling to France for their trip this year. And uh, one of the highlights of that trip is they will be singing at Normandy on D-Day. Wow. Uh, I wish I could be there. Uh, but hopefully somebody will record it, uh, take pictures, 
But uh, they're going to be leaving either Tuesday or Wednesday. Leave out Friday. Leave out Friday, okay. <laughs> Uh, they are going to be having a concert uh, today at 4 o'clock at Endurance Church. And if you've not heard them uh, and you don't have anything else to do this afternoon, go to Endurance Church at 4 o'clock. I promise you that you will not be entertained. You will be blessed. <coughs> and uh, so 4 o'clock at Endurance. But we want to be praying for them that God gives them a, a safe trip and that it's a fruitful trip for them that everybody enjoys their time and that while they're there they will be a blessing to the people of France so we want to keep them in our prayers along with all the others that are on our prayer list today and uh, if you have a need if you would acknowledge it by an uplifted hand we'll take our cares to the Lord Heavenly Father we thank you for this day we thank you for this honor that we have to be in your house and to come together as a family of faith. I thank you for every guest that is here today, for everyone that is joining us uh, by way of the internet. I pray your blessings on each of them. Father, I pray that our time today here will glorify you. We know you're here because you are faithful to your promise that where we gather together in your name, you are in our midst. And so I pray that we worship you in spirit and in truth and that we glorify you today. Thank you for allowing us to bring our needs to you today. I ask, Lord, that you would uh, prepare the way for those that uh, have procedures this week, those that will be traveling, uh, those that have uh, difficulties in their life that they need you uh, to help with. Every need that is acknowledged on our prayer list, every need that was uh, signified today by an uplifted hand, I pray, God, that you would minister to each one according to your will and your purpose. I pray, God, that you would help me today to minister those things that you have placed in my heart to share and that you would be with your people wherever they are gathered today. Lord, that they would be encouraged, that you would be uplifted, and that you would receive all of the glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Before we dismiss our uh, kids to Sunshine Kids today, Last Sunday was graduate recognition. And uh, I'm not going to make any excuses. Uh, this, this falls on me. With the uh, many forms of communication we have these days, I received information about graduates from several different sources. Uh, email, text, messenger, word of mouth, hand me a note. Uh, and so a whole lot of different ways we can communicate these days. And uh, I overlooked, it was my fault, I went back, I looked, it was there, but I overlooked a graduate. And uh, I, I apologize for that, and yet it worked out. Because had I recognized this young man last week, he wouldn't have been here. <laughs> and he's here today. And this is a grandson <coughs> of David and Frankie Jones. And uh, his name is Jackson Huffstedler. He graduated 8th grade salutatorian from Junction Hill School. Uh, he His... Uh, Parents are Andy and Mindy Huffstedler. His other grandparents are Carl and Margaret Huffstedler. Uh, Jackson was on the honor roll, uh, principal's honor roll. He was active in Beta Club and Student Council. Uh, he also received the Outstanding Baseball Award and was also the recipient of the overall Outstanding Hornet Trophy for the entire school. And so congratulations to Jackson. Jackson, if you would come up. We want to give you just a little... <laughs> Thanks for being here today and 
helping me out of a jail. <laughs> We're going to dismiss the kids, the sunshine kids today. Miss Kelly will have something special for you up there. And uh, while they are making their way out, I want to also say that uh, not only is this uh, Memorial Day Sunday, but this is Pentecost Sunday. And uh, I am going to be uh, sharing with you uh, some thoughts today about Pentecost. And uh, if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2. Uh, I am going to be brief in my text today, and I will also try to be brief in my remarks. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse number 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. A lot had taken place, and the disciples had seen Jesus numerous times since his crucifixion and resurrection. They saw him on the day of his resurrection in the very room that they are now sitting when this text is being written about. It was in that room a week later that Jesus had his encounter with Thomas. They had also seen him on the shores of Galilee and several other places. And just a week and a half prior, they saw him ascend into heaven. And now they are waiting because that is what he told them to do to go back to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, at about 9 o'clock in the morning, the promise arrived. You can read about this uh, more fully if you want this afternoon or sometime to read the second chapter of Acts. About nine o'clock in the morning, there came a sound like as of a rushing mighty wind. The Bible said it filled the room where they were sitting. And what looked like tongues of fire appeared on the heads of the apostles. And although there were people in town from all over the country, each of them heard in their own language what the apostles were saying, and the Bible says that they were amazed. When we talk about the day of Pentecost, we are referring to a particular moment that we call the birthday of of the church. Now it's not the birthday of the Pentecostal church. Just as it's not the birthday of the Baptist or the Methodist or the Presbyterian or any other church that we could mention today. The early church was just known as the church. There were no labels. That all came later. But when we talk about Pentecost, we're talking about this particular moment. But Luke states that when the day of Pentecost was fully come. So that indicates that Pentecost was not a new development. Pentecost already existed. Which leaves us to ask the question, well then, what is Pentecost? There are three major festivals that God commanded the children of Israel to observe. There was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which we know as the Passover. There was the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles. 
And that was a feast where the Israelites would erect makeshift uh, tents or dwellings. And they were to live in them for a week. And that was to signify God's provisions and protection over them while they were in the wilderness. And then this other is called the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Pentecost. And it was very important to Old Testament worship. And there's a, a whole lot more to this festival than I have time to uh, go into today. And so I want you to remember these two facts. The major focus of the feast was the celebration of the first fruits at the spring harvest. And the reason it's called the Feast of Pentecost is because it took place 50 days after Passover. That's what the word Pentecost means, is 50. And the last reference to Pentecost in the Bible is in Acts chapter 2 where we took our text. So if there was a last Pentecost, then when was the first Pentecost? Well, since we know that Pentecost took place 50 days after the first Passover, If we want to know when the first Pentecost was, we have to find out when was the first Passover. Well, the first Passover originated on the last night that Israel was in the captivity of Egypt. On that night, God had commanded the Israelites to gather their families together. They were to sacrifice a perfect lamb. They were to take the blood of that lamb and to spread it on the upper beam and the door jams of their doors. And God promised that there was going to be a death angel that would come through and that the firstborn of all would die. <coughs> But if he saw this blood on the doorpost, that he would pass over that house and the firstborn would live. And that's why it's called the Passover. That was the first Passover, just before they left Egypt. So then to find out when is the first Pentecost, we have to look at where Israel was 50 days after that first Passover. And when you read in the book of Exodus chapter 19, you find that they are at Mount Sinai where they are about to receive the law from God. Now, I don't think this was by chance because I don't think that God does anything without purpose. Even when we don't grasp that purpose at the moment, there's purpose in everything that God does. If we do a comparison between the two Pentecosts, the one at Mount Sinai and the other at Jerusalem, we find some very interesting similarities. The first Pentecost marked the birth of the Israelite nation. The last Pentecost marked the birth of Christianity. Number two, Exodus 19, verse 18 tells us that Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire that everyone could see. And then in Acts chapter 2, we're told that the crowd saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest upon each of them that were assembled there. 
And number three, both events involve God's people receiving a gift. At the first Pentecost, Israel received the law. While at the second Pentecost, those who became Christians received the gift of the Holy Spirit. But as intriguing as that is, why should that matter to us today? I mean, really, why should we care about these historical things that happen in Scripture? Well, it matters because it shows how much God cares about us. He cared enough about our salvation and he spent time, even in small details like we're talking about this morning. I think the subject of Pentecost is also important because it shows us the intricacy of Scripture. The Bible is so interwoven that there is no chance that it is the result of human authorship. Only a mighty and caring God could tie the storyline together that spans a period of some 1,500 years. Starting back in the days of Moses and then climaxing in the days immediately following the ascension of Jesus Christ. I think that's some interesting stuff. When I begin to delve into Scripture and begin to pull some of these things out, it's just interesting to me how, how God weaves all of this together for our understanding if we take a moment to really try to, to figure it out. Now that some good stuff, but what really caught my attention and caused me to preach this message today I think is even more impressive than that. When Israel was at Mount Sinai at the first Pentecost. The Bible says that God came down on the mountain of Sinai. There was lightning, there was thunder, there was smoke. And then God speaks from the mountain. And here's the first thing that he says to Israel. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before you. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth below or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And the Bible tells us that so great was this moment, this experience, that the people began to tremble at the voice of God. And so they turn to their leader, Moses, and they say, you speak to us and we will listen. But do not let God speak to us, lest we die. They were afraid. I imagine that it would probably strike a little fear in us if all of a sudden this room was filled with smoke and thunderings and lightnings and all of a sudden some voice came booming in. <coughs> probably some of you would probably head for the, the exit and uh, you might be following your leader. <laughs> so God summons Moses and he goes up to the mountain to be with the Lord. And the Bible says that he's gone for 40 days, so over a month. And the people began to get nervous. 
Now, the children of Israel had never really been a calm people, but uh, at least they could see who was leading them. But now Moses is gone, and they're not even sure he's coming back. I'm sure in the back of their mind, they may, may be thinking there was good reason for us to be afraid. And now Moses has gone up from where we saw all of that happening, and I'm not sure he's coming back. So what did they do? Exodus 32 verse 1 tells us. The Bible says when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Make us gods who shall go before us. Remember what God had told them some 40 days earlier? You're not to have any other gods. You're not to make any images. But here they are. Make us gods who shall go before us. And as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron, who is the brother of Moses, Aaron told the people to bring all of their earrings of gold. The Bible says he melted them down, he took a tool, and he fashioned a golden calf for the people. And the next day they had a festival to worship this golden calf. And man, did they party. The Bible says that they rose up early, they sacrificed burnt offerings, and then they sat down to eat and to drink, and they began to indulge in revelry. They partied and they partied and they partied at least until Moses showed up. And by that time, God's mad. <laughs> Moses is mad. And if you remember, it's at that point that Moses took the two tablets of stone that God had engraved the Ten Commandments on, and he threw them on the ground, and the Bible said they broke into pieces. And then Moses confronts his brother Aaron, and he said, What did these people do to you that you led them into such a great sin? And Aaron's, his answer is classic. He says to his brother, do, do not be angry with me. You, you know how prone these people are to evil. And, and so they came to me and they said, make us gods to go before us. And, and so I told them, whoever has gold jewelry, take it off and and so they gave me the gold, and, and, and I, I put it into the fire, and poof, <laughs> out came this cat. <laughs> the Bible already told us that Aaron took a tool of some kind, and he engraved this calf, but he's telling Moses, hey, man, I, I just put this gold in the fire, and here's the calf. Would you believe that story? Well, neither did Moses. And the Bible says that Moses saw that the people were running wild and that Aaron had let them get out of control. And he decided that something drastic needed to be done to pull the nation back from the brink of destruction. So Moses cries out and he says, He that is on the Lord's side, come stand beside me. And the whole tribe of Levi, the tribe of Levi is where the priesthood came from. The whole tribe of Levi came and stood with Moses. <laughs> And Moses said to them, and this is a very tra a loose translation of Exodus 32, verses tw uh, 26 and 27. But Moses said, boys, strap on your swords. The 
because we're fixing the clean house. And by the time they had finished their work, a vast number of Israelites lay dead on the ground. Do you know how many people died that day after that first Pentecost? Exodus 32.28 says about 3,000 people died that day. About 3,000 people died after the first Pentecost. Do you know how many people were saved at the last Pentecost? The Bible says about 3,000 about 3,000 were added to the church that day. Coincidence? Uh, I don't think so. I want you to listen to what 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 says. He has made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter, he's talking about the law, the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The first Pentecost brought the law, and the law brought death, because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of the Lord. And Romans 6 Verse 23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. And, and so we have all sinned and we all deserve to die. But that's the reason that Jesus came and died on the cross for us. That's why Romans 6.23 doesn't stop by saying the wages of sin is death. It finishes by saying, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, any religion can come up with a way for nice people to get into heaven. Christianity is the only religion that is based on the truth that Jesus will save even the worst of us. Jesus came so that people who deserve to die could receive a new life. And that's the mystery of Pentecost. In the story of Pentecost, we read the whole message of Scripture, the law given at the first Pentecost. That decree, we all deserve to die. But the Spirit given at the last Pentecost declared that all who deserve to die were offered life through Jesus Christ. And so I recognize Pentecost not as a description of a certain style of worship. Because it has nothing to do with worship styles. I recognize Pentecost for the biblical truth that it is. And by choosing to recognize Pentecost, I choose to recognize the life that is available in Jesus Christ for whosoever will. It's not just for a certain class of people. Whosoever will, let him come and drink freely from the waters of life. It is a life that is available for the most undeserving. I was talking to my friend, uh, Pastor Andy Lambell, from the Methodist Church a couple of days ago, and he said, you know Sunday's Pentecost, don't you? I said, yeah. He said, you're going to be preaching on Pentecost? I said, no, I'm going to be preaching on Methodism. (laughs) 
And uh, after we had a little laugh about that, we got to sharing with each other some of the things we were going to talk about. And uh, I guess probably the most simplest way to put it is that the first Pentecost brought law. The last Pentecost brought grace. And I'm thankful for grace. I'm thankful that the law has been fulfilled in Christ. And even today, we don't really get what we deserve. But the unmerited favor of Jesus Christ is available to all. And I'm thankful today that the call still goes forward to all that wants to come to Him. And He freely receives them in His love and in His mercies. And so today... If anybody asks you about Pentecost, just tell them it's grace. Just make it simple. It's all about God's grace. And I'm thankful that we have the Scripture, and I'm thankful that, that in the church calendar, we recognize days like today. We recognize Easter. We recognize the Ascension. We have all of these religious things that, that many just choose to to shy away from because, oh, well, they're just, you know, this is just Christian symbolism. No, there were real reasons why all of this took place. And we recognize them today because it brings beautiful truths to mind about living in the grace of Jesus Christ. And I am so thankful for that today. Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your word that is eternal for your word that is true. Lord, I thank you that in the pages of Holy Writ we can go and we can find understanding, that we can find those things that encourage us in the things that maybe we don't understand or in the things that we don't readily look at. Pentecost is once a year that we recognize it, but God... Pentecost should be an everyday thing in our life because it is grace. It's your grace. It's those mercies that are new every morning that we have access to. And so, Lord, today I thank you. I thank you for your wisdom. I thank you, Lord, for your endearing love to us. A love that is not only endearing but enduring. It's with us always. And so, Lord, I pray today for everyone in this congregation. If any are here today and you've never experienced that grace, you've never confessed your, your sins and invited Jesus into your life, I pray that you would do that today. I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit is still a free gift to all that would come and be partakers of it. And so, Lord, I pray that you would fill us anew every day with your spirit and with your blessing so that we can live a life that is reflective of you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. I invite us to gather today at the table of the Lord in communion. I can't add anything from my message today to this act of worship. Because encapsulated in communion is all of the messages that could ever be preached from his word. Because you can't separate the two. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gave his disciples a promise. He said, I'm going to come again. And I'm going to receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. But until that day, there's something I want you to do. And as often as you do it, I want you to do it this way. And he took the bread, he blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body which is broken for you.
Likewise, he took the cup, and after blessing it, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and drink all of it. This is the new covenant in my blood that is shed for me. Let's bow our hearts in prayer. <coughs> Gracious Father, I stand in amazement today at the depth of your love. For you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Lord, today, as we gather together at the table, we remember your sacrifice, the price paid for our salvation and our redemption. Lord, today, I pray that we would always honor you, that we would always be in remembrance. And so today, Lord, forgive us of our sin. Help us in our areas of weakness. Lord, help us to grow and mature in the things of the Spirit so that we can live our life and allow our light to so shine so that others can see you and be drawn to your embrace. Father, thank you for this wonderful congregation of people today. Lord, I pray your blessings upon each one of them. Pray, God, that you would use us for your purpose. Keep us in your care. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen <coughs> and amen. <coughs> Mary's going to come back and lead us in our closing hymn today. I invite us all to stand as we sing. Well, you take your hymn, we'll turn to hymn number 465. 465 in this time. <laughs> Again, I want to thank you all for being here, those that are still with us by way of the internet. Thank you. I pray that the rest of your weekend, tomorrow, probably most everybody's off of work. Uh, so I pray that whatever 
you're going to be doing. I know this is a weekend when a lot of people go to the lake, do a lot of travel. Uh, so I pray that God would keep you, that his hand of protection would be about you, and uh, that we will all be back together again next Sunday upstairs. Uh, I'm excited about that, but you know what I'm thinking? Uh, several years ago, uh, we determined that we would uh, remodel this area. Uh, when we decided that, all of the walls were paneling, the carpet was tiled, and uh, we would have a fellowship meal. And uh, if you were sitting on that side of the table and I was sitting on this side, and we tried to have a conversation. Neither one of us knew what each other said. We just <laughs> smiled and nodded. <laughs> and then when you left, you had this ringing in your head. And so we, uh, we decided to remodel it. And what a beautiful uh, fellowship hall we have. And it's just been uh, a good place for us to, to worship. And to tell you the truth, I've been pleasantly surprised by the comments that were made about, you know, I really like it down here. And uh, everybody being a little closer, the music, the singing sounds a little fuller. And so uh, when we go back upstairs, we're just going to lock the wings down. <laughs> no, we're not going to do that. But uh, I, I want to thank, thank you for being such a wonderful church. And the things that we are able to do and have done has been because of your love and your generosity. And uh, I can't thank you enough. And uh, it's going to be great to uh, be able to get back upstairs. But uh, I, I wouldn't give anything for the last few weeks that we've been together down here. It's been, it's been good. It's been a great place to worship. And uh, thank you. I didn't know... Uh, if y'all would want to sit this close together, and uh, but you did, and it's all worked out fine. And uh, but next week we'll see each other uh, upstairs. Uh, Don, I hope that uh, I hope I did what you wanted me to do today. Uh, just before service started, Don said to me, "We're expecting uh, an outstanding message today." <laughs> And I said, then why are you here? <laughs> I, I hope I fulfilled that. I did my best. And uh, I hope that you'll go home with something you can think about this week. So God bless you. I won't hold you any longer. I'm trying to make it till 10 after 12. <laughs> and so I'll just go ahead and be quiet. As we're dismissed today, let's pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Amen.